continuing our series, the final hour, and we're beginning now to look at the verses that capture from Matthew's perspective this Sermon on the Mount of Olives, this message of eschatological theme that invites an understanding of what this world is going to continually become from that moment that Jesus will ascend to the moment that he returns. I want to read the text before we jump in, just to get bearing, and then we'll walk through and hear the voice of the Spirit speak in as God's Word comes to life with encouragement, challenge, breakthrough, and direction. Matthew chapter 24, starting with verse 3 through the 14th verse, reads, As he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famine, earthquakes, and various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Then will they deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness being increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. May God bless the reading and the life of his word as we begin. The introduction, the Mount of Olives. Remember, we looked at this. This is a place of offense. This is, by name, a place to where those who are in offense, particularly to the city of Jerusalem, have a tendency to wander into and to weep over what could have been, what might have been, what still may be in the hearts and the lives of God's people. Reading verse 3 again, it says, and read along, as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, tell us, when will these things be? What are they asking the question about? When Jesus described the destruction of the temple, not one stone left upon another, when he describes the, this horrific judgment of God that will come down, that will see the nation of Israel without a Messiah and without a king until they will one day say, blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. When, Lord, will these things be? What, Jesus, what you're describing, when is all of this going to take place? And so they ask him, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the world or age? At the heart of their questions, it's the heart of the cry of the nation of Israel, and it's the constant cry of the world around us. I cry for peace. And this peace will only come through deliverance. Israel understood this in a sense, in part. But the manner of peace Jesus is offering is coming through a Messiah that's building the population of a kingdom before it fully comes. For then sin itself will be removed. Jesus' sermon on the mount here, this message, is as much needed today, and I would even argue more needed today. And it will continue to increase in its need the closer that we get to the return of the Lord and that time of tribulation. The offense of this message still proves true as the world looks to the church, the body of Christ, as an outdated relic, distant from the, any solution to the problems that the globe is facing. In fact, it has even begun to be argued that the church and religion and Christianity is a part of the problem and why we cannot have peace in the world around us. Because Christianity says there is no peace. The gospel says there is no peace in the creation without first peace with the creator. And there never will be. There never will be. This is offensive. This is offensive to a world broken and under the dominion of sin. While Jesus' message that we're going to look at speaks heavily of the time of tribulation, that is yet to come. Much of it has already begun in the time of the apostles. The moment that Jesus ascended, it's like when dad walks out of the room and goes to work, behaviors just come out and it's chaos on the home front. It's the sense that as soon as Jesus ascended, the enemy responded to what he started. The baton has been handed to the church to carry on the mission until the return of Christ. 
and the enemy revs up to resist, to fight against, and to reclaim what the gospel says belongs to the Lord. The world still needs Jesus. It still needs this message. And shadows of what Jesus is describing began in that moment, and they continue to increase during this time, this dispensation, this era of the church. It will lead into a time of tribulation that will be over the entire world. Jesus uses the illustration of a woman who has a child being created within her, a pregnancy. And the closer that the delivery time comes, there will be birth pains. And they will be so abrupt, so suddenly, in the intensity of it, that it will be a time to where it is unable to be misunderstood. And these words of Christ will ring true and understood clearly by those who are naming the name of Jesus in this hour. Jesus begins this eschatological message with two warnings, wrapped up in the packaging of a world in constant turmoil. Because of this turmoil, there would always be this longing to find peace. However, sin leads this pursuit in directions other than Jesus. It will never come through diplomacy. It will never come through governments. It will never come through the military strength of any power in this world. In the final hour upon this earth, if we could sum up what Jesus is saying here in five words, it would be this. Deception, dispute, devastation, deliverance, and defection. Certainly not a positive, in a sense, message that you want to hear when you come to church. And it's not what the world wants to hear, and I get that. And it's almost this, this, this idea that as they ask Jesus this question, Jesus, I just wonder if he's like, do you really want to know the answer to this? Do you really want to know how hard it's going to get to stay the course with me? Despite that, he gives us the truth. He lets us know what's ahead of us so that we can take serious and real the importance of his word being grained in us. As we shall see, each one of these, deception flows into dispute, flows into devastation, deliverance, and defection. It all circulates back, and we will end the message with the question that we are going to begin it with. The question of, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Who is he to me? Who is he to us? Because how we answer that is going to be put to the test, and this world will demand that you answer that. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus begins this message with a warning, the first of two warnings. It says in verse 4, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. Jesus begins this message, this warning, and the Greek for see to it or see that, it literally means keeping our eyes open of all that's going around, on around us, situational awareness. When I take our children, and especially our foster children, on hikes, it's very important that they understand situational awareness. They have to understand the terrain, the rocks. They have to understand the branches down, the types of leaves, what to brush against, what not to brush against. Is that a stick? Is it moving? How to respond? We have to be aware of what we are going to face as we go through the journey of that hike and as we go through the journey of this world. But we have to have spiritually inclined eyes. The sight that Jesus is talking about is never going to be experienced outside of his spirit dwelling within us. Outside of being in his word with his spirit. To have eyes that see and ears to hear. To understand what is going on in the world around us. Because there is nothing, as we looked at, that is more encouraging to the enemy. There is nothing of least threat to the kingdoms of this world than a sleeping church. They, we are no more a danger to the defeated enemy of Satan and sin than the apostles were sleeping in the garden when Jesus was praying. We have to have spiritually open eyes. Jesus begins, beware, see to it that no one leads you astray. But Lord, I thought you will finish the work that you began. Lord, I thought once I prayed, once I said yes to you, it was a done deal and I'm set. Then why is Jesus warning us to not be led astray? Listen to this. He says, this astray is a word. It's an action. It's a verb. And it indicates the efforts of an outside force coming in to pull us away from the path, to encourage us to step off of the straight and narrow path. From the moment that we set foot on the journey to the celestial city in Jesus Christ, everything in this world is going to be opposed to staying on that, to detour us. And there will be times that imitation will look like it's running parallel and slowly veering off. But this, this idea of what Jesus is saying, to be mindful that no one leads you astray, to be wise, to be understanding, 
This idea is that Jesus is warning. It's not going to be easy. It's one thing to begin, but it's a whole nother thing to finish. And we have to understand this. We have to understand this. Jesus continues. What do we have to be on guard against? What is the greatest threat to get us to walk off of the path of righteousness? False messiahs, other Christs. Listen to this. If we get Jesus wrong, we get everything wrong. Everything. Everything. Especially eternity. We will not have the ending that, with God that we think we will have. And the Bible lays great weight to provide the truth of what the journey of Christ is. And lays a heavy charge on those like me who answer the call to preach and teach. To do it faithfully. Because if I don't, there is a greater <clears throat> accountability for me and my heart with God. For not preaching, for not knowing his word and giving it to you. And the clarity and the passion and the truthfulness that Jesus did to his own disciples. I must first believe what it is that I'm preaching. Jesus said this, Matthew 16. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, son of Arjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Remember, we talked about spiritual eyes to see, right? The, his, his, his dead in humanity, his dead in sin eyes didn't see and make this declaration. It is the spirit of God that revealed it. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on the earth will be loosed in heaven. But coming back to Matthew 24, Jesus continues this warning, not just about false messiahs, but listen to this. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, and they will lead many astray. It's not just standing against Jesus. It's not just representing themselves as an option to Jesus, but they are going to be tremendously effective in leading people away from Jesus. And what does this look like? And how, how can this be going on right now? And what will it look like leading into the time of tribulation? Before we explore the context of what Jesus is saying here, I want to hear the heart of what he's saying. I want to hear the heart behind this warning. Listen to this. This comes from Hebrews chapter 3. Take care, brothers. The, the, the writer of this, that sounds a lot like Paul, is saying to a congregation of people that are sitting just like you and I are in a service, convinced that they're on the pathway of righteousness. And he says this to them, brothers, sisters, those who name the name of Jesus, listen, be careful, take care, be cautious. Of what? Le that, that in any of us, there is an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It, it, this, the, the urgency of this is so real that it's to be a daily rhythm to encourage us to lay hold on the faith that we have placed in Jesus Christ daily. While it is called today, stir up the love, the passion, the conviction that keeps us faithful to Jesus to recognize who our Jesus is. Matthew 7 says this on that day. Many will say this is Jesus again. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That, that this is a heart coming behind Jesus and his words to his disciples to take care that no one, including a false Messiah, an alternative to me, steps in and says, follow me away from the path that Jesus has laid for us, that the apostles will have laid for us. That scripture lays for us. There is only one path that will lead us into the eternal presence of God. And faithful to it, we must tread, we must walk. For it is, I dare say, the steps that have been grounded into by our Savior, followed by the apostles and the faithful saints that have gone on before us. But be careful. And I, just that communion moment. Someone will betray me. We constantly have to keep guard on our own hearts and our sinfulness. Wicked are our own hearts that only God himself can know them. Search them. Now let's look at the context of what Jesus is saying. First John reads, children, 
It is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that this is the last hour. From the moment that Jesus ascended, the spirit of Antichrist was already at work in the population. And who were those that were gaining this spirit of Antichrist? Those that were sitting within the church, those that were a part of the movement of Jesus. Because to lead away from is very effective when you can begin from within. When you can begin from within. The Antichrist is just this, opposed to Jesus in his person and work. Messiah or Christ is the title that Jesus fulfills in his role as mediator between God and man. To deny this is to, not, to deny God's gift of salvation and only means of hope against his wrath of sin towards sin. There is more behind the false proclamations of the Antichrist that are at work in the world than coming outright and denying Jesus. The work to allure saints from the pathway of holiness is often subtle, it's patient, it's persistent. What is the enemy behind this effort to lead us away from Jesus? It begins with sin, it begins with the devil. Listen to this, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. All these scripture are in your outline. I encourage you to read them. As we go through this, but the, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He has thrown down to been thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. The work that this fallen dragon and demons do, the work that they do in this world is to distract through deception. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And in fact, this, this deception is only going to increase into that hour of tribulation where it says in Thessalonians, let no man deceive you in any way for that day will not come. The day and the return of the Lord will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And that man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. And scripture leads into an understanding that the spirit of Antichrist that had already begun to populate this world the moment that Jesus ascended will continue to exist, will continue to gain strength, and ultimately come to be personified in an individual that will stand to represent fallen humanity against God. But it's not just an image bearer. It is something fueling that is providing a power beyond a mere man. Revelation 13, 3. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, his throne, and great authority. Jesus was tempted. Throw yourself down. Reveal yourself now, and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus said, no, I will be faithful to my father. The enemy comes to fallen man. Do this, and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. And fallen man says, sign me up. I'm yours, is what this, this individual is going to become. But we need not wait until that moment to see that real in the world now, because we're all facing that invitation. Here, I'm offering you something that is without this journey of hardship. Here, I'm offering you something that will take care of what you're desiring right now without having to go through this old religious rhythm that is clearly outdated and not necessary for us today. So this warning about false messiahs, this warning about a deceptive power to lead us away from Christ was very real for his disciples, it's very real for us, and it will be very real during that time of tribulation. But this deception now, if we have a problem with who Jesus is, will flow into what he describes next in verses 6 and 7. Listen to this. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We're not going to spend too much time right here. We're going to look at this next week as we look at Daniel's message. But listen to what Jesus is saying here. The language, the verses do not necessarily specify nations themselves but world powers that are in struggle over resource and struggle over economy, political interests, things that are agendas to accomplish a peace outside of the peace that God offers through Jesus Christ, to be at peace with the creator. All of this stuff is constantly going to be going on and on and on and on and on in the world around us. Why does Jesus insert it right here? Because it's all that on and on and on and on stuff that works against Christians staying faithful to Jesus Christ. And he continues in verses uh, 7, the last portion of 7 to 8, there will be famines and great earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Not only will devastation 
result from the power struggle of the nations fighting over the resources, fighting over the world around us. But the nations, this will result in the resources being abused, depleted. It results in people being displaced and forced into other parts of the world, etc. But Jesus himself, this, this, this pain, this suffering, isn't just from the enemy. It isn't just from sin. Jesus himself, Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 through 8, is going to break the fourth seal and listen to what this seal unleashes. When he opened up the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider was death. Hades followed him. And they were given great authority over the earth to kill with sword and with famine, with pestilence and wild beasts of the earth. And again, we'll look at this more when we look at uh, what Daniel is going to say about this. But understand that the, the Gentile nations fighting over each other, over this world, is only going to continue to get worse. It's only going to continue to progress, but it's only the beginning of birth pains. Delivery hasn't happened yet, and this is going to be a very intense hour. And for those who name the name of Jesus in this time of tribulation, will understand this scripture and will see it lived out. They will understand what's going on in the world around them, and they will be a voice of the reality that this is the soon imminent return of Jesus Christ to remove sin. We need to be ready. We need to have hearts that are prepared for this moment. The delivery is coming. But before that great deliverance from sin comes, believers are going to experience a different kind of deliverance during this time of tribulation. And verse 9, it says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, this is a hard stuff. This is the kind of stuff that clears out a congregation, attenders. This is the kind of message that Jesus gives that the audience beyond the 12 would not have probably received. This isn't how you build, but it's how you speak truth. It's how you, it's how you be Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus experienced the hatred from the world he created. We as well will experience a growing hatred toward us because of our love and our commitment to Christ. The Greek for deliver here, deliver to tribulation, it means forcefully handed over. Forcefully handed over. This is a militant word. A, a think of police. Think of government. Think of breaking in, arresting, and transporting you. That's what's embodied in this word being delivered. It is this authoritative tone that implies that believers, followers of Jesus, will be arrested, will be put on trial, persecuted, and ultimately face death. Why? Because of who we say Jesus is. Because of who we believe Jesus to be. It's our, it's our devotion and our love for Jesus that we sing and celebrate here. Able to stand on trial when our life is at stake. This is Jesus speaking to those that he loves, that he's done life with for three and a half years. As we see the evil from Satan culminate into the Antichrist, we also see the witness of the gospel culminate during that time of incredible tribulation. God is never leaving any generation without gospel invitation. No matter how horrific this time of great tribulation will be, God still has his witness of invitation to come to him through repentance. Listen to this. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for uh, 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. It sound crazy? It's happened before. And God's saying it's going to happen again. And imagine a world that has become so globally small that an event that takes place months, regions beyond us, can be pulled up and witnessed on our phones live. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that we talked about, the Antichrist, who is powerless up to this point, will now stand in his moment of hour. And the beast will rise from the bottomless pit and will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, 
where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the people and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry. They'll exchange presents because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God enters them. And they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on all those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud. Their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heavens. This is going to be so instantaneous that the news feed is not going to be able to catch. I mean, they'll be able to catch the slip ups of a president before they'll be able to catch the resurrection power and cut the air before the world can see and hear about it. I mean, this is something that's going to capture the attention of the entire world. That resurrection is real. Because sin is real, death is real, and Jesus is real. God will not, and this is what's so incredible with this, is that even though we're going through this, how can God be allowing this? Imagine what is going to come as a result of those two people being faithful to Jesus. How many in that final hour are going to place faith in God and are going to say, no more, I'm going to repent, I surrender to this God. The same way that while we suffer and know God's strength, others look upon us and say, I want to know more about this God. Deliverance to suffer. But Jesus also finishes this message with the hardest of all defection. Defection of a false faith, believers, apostates. Matthew 24, 10 through 13. Listen to this. Read along with me God's word. And then many will fall away. And please, as we read this, don't say not I. Many will fall away. Not I, Lord. Just listen to Jesus. Allow his words to penetrate our heart. Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray because lawlessness will be increased. The love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. You say, I could, I, my children will never rise up and hate me. My spouse will never hate me. My parents would never hate me. My neighbors would never hate me. This, when we looked at the, the vaccine alone is dividing and cultivating hate. To where, it depend, and again, not endorsement either side. What I'm saying is just look at how willingly we're able to hate each other, how quickly we're able to hate each other, how quickly. You can't come over here without it. You can't do this without it. Mom, dad, son, daughter. Look how quickly we're able to be divided. Imagine when the Holy Spirit pulls back and sin is able to have a much further reality. We are naturally prone because of sin to hate. This brings us full circle with the beginning of this message. Who is Jesus to you and me? All this suffering, all this warfare, all this persecution that will come for following Jesus. If your love and faith in him is not true, this world will prove it prove it if Jesus is anything less than he claimed to be the Messiah the Christ the way the truth and the life such faith will not stand against the suffering the true path of righteousness requires you will never reach and I know I allude to John Bunyan a lot you'll never reach a celestial city if it's not about Jesus you never will it's not about the problem do you ever wonder why God in his word talks little of what that reality is going to be like comparative to the need of the journey to get there and to stay there because all of those promises mean so little they're treasures to us as we truly grow in intimacy and love to jesus but those promises will not lead us there it is the love for jesus it begins with that it must continue in that and it's swallowed up in that if it's ever anything but jesus it will never be enough we're one trial one suffering one hour of hardship away from abandoning him not I, Lord. What is our faith in Christ to be measured by? 
How do we know if we're staying the course? John chapter 8, Jesus said, and we're talking a lot about Jesus' words. And again, this is the stuff that we don't think about when we think about Jesus. We think about loving Jesus, who, who elevates, who, who steps in and loves, who demonstrates the love of God. But all of who Jesus is, is based on the truth of who God is, his Father. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you abide in my word, then you're truly my disciples. Very simple. If we don't abide in his word, what are we? Not his disciples. They went out from us, John writes, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. And I say this. Never give up, never stop praying, never stop in the hope of Christ that he is the good shepherd that goes after the one that is astray. As long as we have breath in our body, as long as I have breath in my body, I am continually pray for. Not only, and this isn't talking about people who leave one church because they don't like the pastor, don't like the worship songs, not enough hymns, too loud, the pastor doesn't preach in King James, or he, I didn't like his beard, whatever the reasons are that we move on. That's not what that's talking about. This is about walking away from faith in Jesus Christ. I've seen those. And I pray for them. And I continue to pray for them who are not walking with Jesus anymore. I don't give up because my God can do anything. However, the reality of what this is saying is that they're at a very dangerous place. They're at a very dangerous place. And they need prayer, intercession, and the gospel loved out to them. Don't be okay with people living like that. Don't be okay in your heart that it's all going to turn out okay. That's not the message that Jesus is giving his disciples. And that shouldn't be our message. That go do what you're going to do. God will work it out. He will work it out, but it may not be the way that you're hoping, thinking, and believing. And I say this because if there's anything that we need to get right in this world, it's Jesus and his message. False prophets appeal to those who are not walking in the truth of God's word. He said... Many false prophets will arise and lead many people astray. And no wonder, Paul writes, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The pleading of faithful pastors falls on ears that grow deaf to the word of God. Why? Because lawlessness increases. This term lawlessness, nomia, it indicates a disregard for the word of truth. This lawlessness is a very unique word because it means they know the truth, but they deny it. That means that they are most likely in context, those who grew up in the church and say, you know what, that's not for me. I know that God and the way that church lived it said this was sin, but my, it's okay for me. I'm going to do this. Even though God calls it sin, that's an archaic understanding. That's, that's old school. This is the world we live in now. And we, they, we have a tendency to flaunt now. Look at the news. We flaunt our sins. I'm in a same-sex relationship. I am identifying as this. I am uh, uh, ascribing to this effort and this work. And I'm standing on the side of this. When clearly, in God's word, he calls it sin. Lawlessness. And I'm, not, I, I'm preaching the word. Lawlessness, that's what it means. It means we know the truth. And we deny it. Intentionally purposefully and flamboyantly because of our disregard for it to be qualified as truth. It's not my truth. That's what this means. Understand what Jesus is talking to. He's not talking about those outside of the church. He's talking to those that are here that are saying, not I, Lord. Not I. Satan doesn't allure us by being a dragon breathing fire. He allures us by coming in and dressing like Jesus. I'm Jesus, but you can indulge in this sin. I'm Jesus, but it's okay to live like this. It's okay to do this because God loves you. He created you this way. It's okay and leads away from it, the truth. Revelation 9, the rest of mankind who were not killed by all these plagues they still do not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders 
or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Despite everything that God is going to do and the greatest of tribulations, the unleashing of the reality of what sin is, defiant to the end, mankind will be and say, no, I refuse to bow my knee. I refuse to call what I'm doing sin. I refuse to repent of this. What a horrific place to be. What more can God do? What more could have could God have done? I am the faithful vine dresser. I cleared out the rocks. I cultivated the ground. I fertilized. I tended. I ensured you had everything to bring forth a rich and fruitful and joyous harvest. But yet you refused. He would say through the prophet. And one more thought before we close on, on the final section here. The False prophets, prophecy, no church is without this voice coming in. And even when we talk about spiritual gifts, it's, it's never a coincidence that people just show up, <clears throat> just show up in, the, in specific times with a word from God. And I, I've said this before, and I'm going to say it very clearly now. Anybody that says they have a word from God that's contrary to the word of God, it did not come from God. It did not come from God. There have been messages circulating even within us as a congregation that I've had to tell individuals. They are not empowered to share this word with anybody in this church. Come to your pastor, come to your elders first. And I still get messages. So-and-so called me with this message. The enemy will always seek out weakness. Weakness. When I first started dating my wife, I had a dog, Max. He loved to pull food off the table and I remember eating and he was staring and I don't remember what it was maybe fried chicken I think that was one of his weaknesses anyway he reached up grabbed it right off the plate ran off with it and I'm like what just happened everybody laughed because I was a weak link everybody else knew what he would do if it was given opportunity and he did I wasn't ready I didn't have my eyes open I wasn't watching I was the weak link I didn't have discernment that was the last time he took some from me because it was good fried chicken. <laughs> but, Pastor, somebody came and brought a word to me. Did it come from God, or is it because you're hungry for something and anything that you're willing to take dumpster food? The enemy, enemy knows that. How is your discernment? Are you more in prophecies? Are you more in Facebook? Are you more in all of these different research venues that unpack these mysteries than we are in the Word of God? We may be following false prophecies, false prophets, people that are not connected to God. Be more in God's word. And if somebody comes to you with a word, here's a good gauge. Where did you go to church last Sunday? Oh, you didn't go to church? You're not being faithful to God's command to begin with. So why is God speaking to you with a message to me who was in church on Sunday? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. If somebody's living contrary to God's word and comes to you with a voice from God, question because that's not the example anywhere in God's word be mindful church we need to be discerning eyes open spiritually looking and seeing this closes in Matthew 24 14 and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come in this lies the mission before us as followers of Jesus Christ. As horrific as this is, this picture that Jesus paints on how this world is going to become, it is not without the reality of what ultimately will come. Yes, we have to have tribulation, but what is being born, what is being created in this woman that is having child within her? It is a new creation, right? It is a new creation being created in the woman. And this new creation, once it is the hour of deliverance, once it hits that final week, it is going to be birth pains. They're going to see this child come forth. And when this child is born, this new creation is completely severed and the old will be gone. That's the illustration that Jesus is giving. That's how he's bringing his kingdom. He's bringing it out of this world. And in the end, in his glorious appearing, sin will be gone. It will be removed. The suffering, will, all of that will be gone. Here's what Jesus is saying with the gospel of the kingdom going out to all the world. Jesus' church will be built. Resist against it. Stand against it. The gates of hell will not prevail against the suffering church. 
that will be faithful to her Lord and Savior. Jesus will build his church. Jesus' kingdom will come. It will come. In fact, in ways it's already here. Jesus will see his enemies under his feet. And Jesus will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the hope that we look towards. This is the reality of who Jesus is, that we stand and say, he is my Lord, he is my Savior. My life lives out in obedience to him. My life is feeding off the truth of him. And every part of who I am will demonstrate this out, regardless of the suffering that may come, regardless of the suffering that will touch us. Who is Jesus Christ? to each of us. We must answer that question, not once in a sinner's prayer, every single day we get up in the morning. Every single hour we close our eyes to end the day. We have to answer this question, who is Jesus Christ to us? Who is he to me? Who is he to me? No going deeper questions this week. No going deeper questions. I'm asking you, church, as a pastor, your pastor. I'm asking two things of you. The first one is to read the first letter of John in the New Testament. I want you to read it. Pastor, how do I know I'm saved? I'm not going to say anything. It's not my job to affirm your salvation. The Holy Spirit does. Read the first letter of John. Then reach out and let's talk. What areas of your heart are burning with conviction? Where are we in our journey with Christ after reading 1 John? The other letter that I want us to read this week is 2 Peter, regarding the danger of following after things more than we follow after Jesus. They're very present, they're very real, and we can become ensnared in them so quickly, so easily. 2 Peter is how we strengthen our discernment as we do life in this world as pilgrims, faithful all the way to the end. That's all I'm asking of you this week. Read 1 John. Reach out to me if you have questions. Read 2 Peter. Reach out to me, and let's talk about what it is to stay faithful to Jesus all the way to the end. I want to invite us to stand. We were going to close in worship, but um, I want to close us in prayer. I went a little over. I want to be respectful of everyone, everyone's time. I know a lot of things are going on. But this, again, this is, we asked. Jesus, what is the end of the world going to be like? This is what it's going to be like. But that end is already in motion for us today. So live for Jesus. Go out of these walls and share Jesus faithfully. Live and demonstrate Jesus faithfully. And pray and intercede on behalf of those who you long to see with you here in church. Because he has not come. The end is not here. The birth pains have not brought forth the end. There's still time for our God who can do anything.